Good evening. On this nice stormy night, there are storms around, but there are no storms here. It is peace in the valley, and yet, there are no storms here yet. So, well, yeah, maybe on the way home you'll need a paddle, but right now we're fine. We are just fine. And we're going to open with a word of prayer, and hopefully you have picked up a handout sheet on the music stand, and you're uh, all set, ready to go. So why don't we have a word of prayer? Lord, we just come to you tonight and thank you for being with us here this evening. We thank you, Father, so much for the word of God, and we pray, Lord, that you would allow us to learn tonight from it. Help us, Father, to have an understanding of the millennial kingdom. Lord, there's just so many passages in Scripture that relate to this kingdom. And we pray, Father, that we would have an understanding of where those passages are and what all is being said uh, so that we can understand God's word better. So again, we thank you for the precious promises that you've made to not only Israel, but to us as your followers, your disciples. Uh, Lord, we're just so thankful that you are a God who honors his word. And Lord, uh, we pray that uh, we would be encouraged by that. So teach us tonight, Father, help it to be a blessed time, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this evening, uh, we're going to, um, we're going to just do things a little bit differently than uh, I had laid out originally. So originally, there's four parts that we're going to be examining, and tonight should be worship in the Millennial Kingdom. And then the last week is next Wednesday, and we were looking at uh, the people who are alive during the Millennial Kingdom and how those relationships go together. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to finish our notes from last week, okay? We're going to finish those. So I made up a new sheet. So what you've got is you've got an overlap. If you picked up last Wednesday night's uh, handout, you'll find that tonight's is going to overlap with that. So don't become too concerned. What I did was I picked up uh, from where we didn't, cover the material last week and added it to the handout and then I put an introduction section that I really hadn't planned on going over but I put that in the beginning of your handout tonight so the first half of our study tonight we'll be talking about uh, the different views uh, here that uh, are concerned the second coming of Christ and then we'll talk about the Millennial Kingdom and some of the characteristics dealing with uh, Israel in the Millennial Kingdom, the Gentiles in the Millennial Kingdom. We'll talk about the uh, city of Jerusalem and the significance of Jerusalem. And we'll also talk about uh, Palestine as a whole. So there's just so many scriptures that pertain to the Millennial Kingdom. It's just fairly amazing when you, when you start to uncover them all. But I thought tonight it might be helpful for us, and I'm, I'm judging this off of the questions and comments that I've fielded over the last couple of weeks, and I just thought, well, this might be helpful uh, for us to be able to understand. So when you stop and you consider uh, the second coming, there are four views concerning the second coming. Um, this is not a seminary class. Aren't you glad for that? But I just thought, I, you know, every once in a while, I just want to, like, toss something out there for you that, that you know, you're just kind of, you're kind of advanced. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, Chileism is so named from the meaning 1,000. So if you ever get a book, and for, some, uh, for some of you, um, you may buy Pentecost's book on things to come, for instance, or you may come across this term in other places. I think it's always good to know a theological term. And so if you come across uh, something that talks about chiliastic or chiliism, it's the study of the 1,000 years, okay? So they might not term it the millennial kingdom or the millennium. They might term it, you know, this is a, a chiliastic theology. Well, what in the world does that mean, right? And so uh, I just want to throw that out there to you so that if you hear that term, you might say, you know, 
can't remember where I heard it, but I remember hearing it, <laughs> if you're like me. Uh, you know, but, but maybe it'll stick as well, and you'll sit there and go, oh, yes, I know what he's talking about. He's talking about, uh, for instance, the, uh, the Millennial Kingdom. So I just put that in there for your notes. So let me give you these four main views of the second coming of Christ. It would be safe to say that there is widespread agreement on the whole issue of the second coming of Christ. But there are four predominant views here. The first is a non-literal or spiritualized view. So this one view is not going to look at the second coming of Christ as, as truly a literal coming. This is going to deny that there is a literal coming or a bodily coming of Christ. Who invented non-literal or spiritualized view? When no uh, spiritualized, what do we mean when we talk about those things that are spiritualized? When you spiritualize something, you are taking a literal word or a phrase or even a sentence. And you're putting with it, you, you feel like you have the freedom to put with that any type of interpretation whatsoever. Okay? So we might read about the literal return of Jesus Christ, but a spiritualized view is truly a non-literal view. Um, you've heard of the term allegorizing? Okay, that's very similar to spiritualized. So when I was teaching the course in China on hermeneutics, and uh, I think I, I mentioned uh, this. I, I told them to take the passage in Kings that deals with uh, the ravens, you know, and the brook Cherith and, you know, coming and being. And I said, I want you to spiritualize this meaning. And it was so, it was so cool because they all started murmuring among themselves, like, like I'd said something really wrong. And the interpreter, Canaan, he looked at me and he said, Kevin, they're struggling with this assignment because all week long you've been teaching them this is not how we interpret the Scripture, and you're asking them now to spiritualize this. So I, I said, I fully understand that, and I, we, we talked back and forth, the class and I, through the interpreter, and uh, made them understand that, that, that it's just an illustration. I'm not telling them this is how we ever are going to do it, but it's a great illustration. So I encouraged them to go as wild as they possibly could with this uh, spiritualizing the text. So they took it, and uh, I mean, this one fella, he stands up, and it was, it was kind of out there, you know. I mean, when you're trying to make it crazy, y you know, it's, it's kind of fun. Um, and this other fellow stands up, and he hadn't said anything basically the whole week, and he stands up, and he says, you know, he says, uh, what I see here uh, in these, these black ravens that are coming to, to feed, uh, you know, the prophet of God, I see them as starting off as white doves. But somewhere along the line, they flew through a cloud of sin and they became black. And, and he goes on and he's just, you know, going on. And, and they said to me, they said, this is how a lot of preachers in China will preach. Uh, they will spiritualize things. Um, that is very common in uh, a lot of places here in the United States as well. Uh, where you see an allegorical or, or more so a spiritualizing of the text. So you're not taking the text literally at all, and you're attaching to it whatever meaning fits your presupposition. Uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't do what the class did, try to just create a crazy scenario for sake of, but what you're going to do is, if you're spiritualizing things, you're trying to take your theology and you're trying, with all those presuppositions, you're trying to mold it that particular Bible verse, phrase, text, whatever, word, and you're trying to mold it so that it fits your particular theology. And that's where it's so dangerous, all right? That's where it's so dangerous. That's why I think we need to be careful uh, before we say we're, you know, oh, I'm a, I'm a hyper-Calvinist or I'm an Arminian or I'm this or I'm that. You buy into a specific school of theology and you will find that what ends up happening is you have got to mold your beliefs at times because you're going to come to passages that really aren't going to seemingly on the outside with a, with a quick, quick glance, they're not going to really fit your theology. 
And what are you going to do about that? Well, you end up with what with, with I call shoehorn theology. You know how you, you go, remember? Do you remember the day? Now I'm going to date myself. Do you remember the day when you went into a real shoe store and they sat you down and they measured your feet on one of those metal things? Now they don't really give a rip, do they? I mean, they just like, eh, there's the shoes. Go find what you want. It's like you, you can't even find one of those measurement things. You just kind of trial and error. You just kind of try them on. Uh, <laughs> X-ray machine, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's like, no, we used to go in there, and then the guy would have a shoehorn, right? And so you wouldn't, like, I remember just having a pair of loafers and just jamming your feet in, like I did tonight when I came. Uh, you know, you just jam your feet into the shoe, and it just kind of works that way. But sometimes, you know, it would be a little tight, and uh, they'd take that shoehorn. Sometimes it was even on extended. You ever see those cool ones? You know, they're like, oh, yeah, I can get you from here. And, uh, and, and you jam your foot up into that. Well, that's this theology. Oftentimes, the theology that we have presuppositions and pre-held pre beliefs doesn't fit the text, and we jam the text into our theology. We have to be really careful of that. Now, I don't mind saying all those things because it's actually going to fit with what we're talking about here in this um, first part because what you're going to see is that one of these four views has really been uh, mishandled, and uh, it's a product of that shoehorn theology. Uh, so uh, anyway, the, the first one, non-literal and spiritualized, really at first view they might seem like a dichotomy, but they're the same. They're the same. So <clears throat> you're reading something that talks about the literal bodily personal return of Christ, and you're saying, no, I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to spiritualize it. And instead it's going to be this or it's going to be that. So this view sees the second coming as being fulfilled uh, in the destruction of Jerusalem or the day of Pentecost or the death of a, a, a Christian, uh, the conversion of an individual, any one of things. So, so it's kind of like, well, the second coming came to them when they placed their faith in Jesus. You know what I mean? It's spiritualized. It can go in a million different directions, and no one can say you're wrong, okay, when you take that view. The second view is the post-millennial view. Post-millennial view uh, is the view that the return of Jesus Christ comes after, hence the word post, post-millennial. comes at the end of this 1,000 years, which then begs the question, when does the 1,000 years start? And what exactly triggers the start of that 1,000 years? This is a popular view, or was a popular view. I'm going to past tense it. Uh, among covenant theologians and certain people that came out of the Reformation period. Uh, Walver, John Walver, he, he wrote the, the commentary on the Revelation of Jesus Christ, one of the best books that you can get on the book of Revelation. Uh, in fact, if you, you want two books on prophecy, you want to get Things to Come by Pentecost and Revelation by Walver. Those are the two books that are really a must-have. Otherwise, you, you'll be kind of adrift, I think. Uh, in some ways. Walvert is W-A-L-V, as in Victor, O-O-R-D, Walvert. He says this, that through preaching the gospel, the whole world will be Christianized and brought to submission to the gospel before the return of Christ. So this is his synopsis of what this view is. He is not a post-millennialist, Walvert, but he's saying that this is basically what they believe. So the general belief was that through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, the world will be Christianized. In other words, we used to hear about it when I was young, and some, some things like that remind me how old I am, uh, because I remember hearing that there were those who were teaching that things were getting better and better and better, and at the conclusion of that thousand years, things were going to be so wonderful that Jesus was going to return. That's post-millennialism. All right. Amillennialism uh, came into into view and, and the word ah, when you put ah before millennialism, what does it mean? It means there's no there. There's no millennial. And that's what I have here. This is the official sign now for no uh, millennium. <laughs> OK, there's there's a millennialists um, that basically believe and I want you to hear this. All the prophecies concerning the kingdom are being fulfilled 
in the inner advent period spiritually by the church okay and so what we're going to find as we kind of pull apart amillennialism is there's a couple of different uh, camps within amillennialism and I'm not going to even try to lump everybody into one or the other but understand the basic thought here uh, as we go through this their um, their controversy the amillennialist controversy is over the question as to whether or not there's a literal millennium for Israel or whether the promises concerning the millennial kingdom uh, have been or are being fulfilled in, by the church okay and when I say by the church, it's either by the church here on earth or there's another segment of amillennialists that believe that it's being fulfilled in the heavens. OK, that this these passages of Scripture uh, that we've been studying dealing with the millennial kingdom are actually a reference to those who are in heaven. And so the millennial kingdom is taking place not on earth, but in heaven. OK, so uh, there's the difference. The third or the. Uh, the last view, the fourth view, is the premillennial view. That's the view that Jesus Christ's second coming uh, is right at the close or at the end of the seven-year tribulation. And as such, uh, his coming allows for uh, the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 12 when we have those days that are kind of, uh, it's uncertain, what do these days mean? And we've said that that was a, a time, most likely, where several different things are happening uh, as the world is adjusting from the time of the end of the tribulation where the judgment is being poured out to the beginning of the thousand-year reign. And we're going to see tonight as we go through and we look at Jerusalem and Palestine, there are some amazing physical changes that actually happen in the world uh, prior to the millennial kingdom and again that would fit in that that time period the central issue for premillennialism which i'm a premillennialist the central issue is that in this position is whether the scriptures are to be fulfilled literally or symbolically that's what it comes down to now let me just give you a little bit of background because everybody wants to know well where did these theological views start in the early church, when I talk about the early church uh, going way, way back, the premillennial view was actually the view that was taught, uh, if, you, if you go way back. But it was, it's interesting, and I'll give you some of the, I'll give you some of the, the reasons why premillennialism was f not favored and why postmillennialism was was favored all right um, but I was just uh, reading here Pentecost he says it was largely replaced uh, by the spiritual view of Augustine this premillennialism it reappears in extravagant forms at the time of the Ref Reformation notal notably among the Anabaptists okay well I, I was seminary trained in Baptist seminary and Bible college too uh, for that matter, so that kind of probably explains why I believe this uh, this particular way, perhaps. Uh, but it's fascinating because if you look back to some of those very early groups, um, it's helpful for us to understand how the doctrine became accepted. All right, and it helps us to understand. You know, we're looking at this and going, "Hey, um, the rise of amillennialism." is such in our culture today it's it's really gained popularity are we right or are we wrong can you imagine all this teaching you know about jesus coming at the here at the end of the tribulation and uh this thousand years and we say it's it's all literal thousand years and and all of that's wrong there's nothing there's nothing there's this and so the seven years isn't real it's not literal. The thousand years is literal. All these passages of Scripture are not literal. There's a, there's a worthy study. Let's figure this out. Let's understand how these things came about so we have some measure of assurance that we're on the right track. Would you agree? So, so, so that when you leave here after tonight and your head is spinning, <laughs> you'll be sitting there going, well, now. 
I need to hear that again. <laughs> and that's fine. I, I find that uh, oftentimes um, teaching, I, I'm a little dense, so teaching has to repeat itself over and over again for me to finally get a hold of it and say, you know what, now, now I understand it, um, and it and it makes sense. Um, <coughs> Let me just uh, give you a couple things here. Let me see where we are um, in the notes. All right. I can just go on and on and not realize where, uh, where you guys are. All right. So I, I want to give you here... Uh, a couple of things with regard to the amillennialists. Uh, Among millennialists who are classified as conservative, there are then two principal viewpoints. Um, and we're, we're going to get to that here in, in just a second. But let me just say, um, a- as we go back through some of this um, post-millennialism, I'm going to back out of this just a little bit. So you might want to take notes on another margin or, or something else. The doctrine of the millennium um, is rejected uh, during a period of time by the Roman Catholics and by the larger number of Protestants. Um, So the premillennial position, the Roman Catholics said, no, we don't believe in the premillennial position. Uh, Why don't they believe in the premillennial position? Anybody? At what's at the root of it? It, it oh, there's no place for the Pope, and that that's very true because you have Christ reigning, and the problem with that is the Pope is Christ's vicar on earth, and so he should be the one reigning. So their theology gets you know they're jamming these scriptures into a hole to fit their theology, which is very true. The other reason that they're not uh, in favor of premillennialism is because premillennialism's hermeneutic method of interpretation is one of a literal, much more so, uh, method of interpretation or a literary method of interpretation versus uh, the spiritualized view. The Roman Catholic Church spiritualizes their interpretation not only of eschatology or the study of last things, but everything else across the board as well. So that's their method of, in, of, of interpretation. Um, and, and yet, even as premillennialism is getting uh, rejected by certain groups within the Protestant uh, Reformation and the Roman Catholic Church, it's, um, it's passed along among these, these uh, smaller groups who were adhering to the Scriptures, uh, basically taking what we would consider to be the correct hermeneutic for 250 years. So it's pretty fascinating. I mean, it, it'll roll all the way into the third century. So that's that's definitely uh, worth worth noting. Now, way back when, let me just give you a little bit of history as well. There's a a number of church fathers. I'm going to pick two of them. One is Justin, and the other is Irenaeus. And uh, in their mind, you're, you'll get a kick out of this. In their mind, there were three classes of men. First class was a heretic. And this is what the heretic believed. He denied the resurrection of the flesh and the millennium. Isn't that something? I mean, that, that, that to me is like, whoa, are you serious? So if you were an amillennialist, like a lot of our brothers and sisters in Christ today are amillennialists, they would be branded a heretic if you go back to uh, the time of Justin and Irenaeus, which is pretty, pretty crazy. Um, the, second her- the second kind of person was... Uh, the exactly orthodox person who asserted both the resurrection and the kingdom of Christ on the earth. And then there were believers who consented with the just and yet endeavored to allegorize and turn into a metaphor all those those scriptures produced for a proper reign of Christ. Wow. We, We haven't really come that far since way back in the early, early, earliest of church. Uh, we, we really haven't strayed much from that. These are the same issues today that we're facing that they dealt with. Right. 
they they were. Let me let me get to that, and I, I'll I'll um, I'll cover that here uh, as as we move forward. Um, so some of the let me just go give you some of the antagonists, uh, some more information here about uh, antagonists towards the millennial position. I think it'll help us to understand why there was so much uh, resistance toward it. Um, but some of the opposition came about uh, because there was in this in premillennialism. There's a great stress on the earth, okay, and. Some people looked at the earth and these blessings as being carnal. Okay? And so, well, those are carnal things, you know. So this is a carnal theology. Uh, and it's like, no, this is about Jesus, right? I mean, uh, I, I, I think you could apply the same thing to the streets of gold. Well, can you imagine? Streets of gold in heaven. I'm not going there. That's carnal, you know. I need to be poor in order to be holy. OK, and that's their mentality that that was a, a prevalent, prevalent mentality um, that led to uh, opposition towards uh, premillennialism. And uh, also, uh, it was interesting because the Alexandrian school of theology was a, a way of interpreting theology. Origin, have you ever heard of origin uh, going all the way back? He was part of the Alexandrian school of theology. They spiritualized everything. They spiritualized everything, and they became very popular. And as they became popular and more and more uh, got more and more traction, they poo pooed the whole idea of a literal kingdom of Christ. Uh, another, you had certain theologies like Gnosticism, for instance. Gnosticism is uh, gaining a lot of steam uh, and running headlong into uh, any type of literal or literary method of hermeneutic. And so that was. Uh, causing problems as well. Uh, it struck a heavy blow uh, to this whole aspect. Docetism is another one. Docetism denied um, the reality of the human body that Jesus had. Uh, they didn't believe that that was true. Asceticism uh, was the belief that there was an inherent corruption of all matter. And so you, when you're talking about a literal kingdom, there's inherent corruption there. So all of these philosophies are, are playing into it. And even Judaism, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, but there was a period of time uh, where there was a lot of enmity between Jewish and Gentile Christians. Think Peter, right? You know, and Antioch and so forth. And there was a lot of animosity. And so when some of the early theologians looked at a literal kingdom that is predominantly Jewish. This is the promises and the fulfillment of all of those promises that Christ, or that God made to the Jewish people. They looked at that and they, they were anti-Semitic and they said, no, we're going to blow this, this theology out of the water because uh, we don't want to see the Jews favored. My friends, listen, when we come to the millennial kingdom, the Jews are favored, okay? They, without a doubt, uh, worship in the world uh, is, is running through Jerusalem. So it's important to, to, note, uh, to note that. Now, body of Christ is separate. We're different, and uh, the, you can't really and shouldn't try to compare the two uh, because they are distinct. So all those things were a problem, and then the, the kind of the cherry on top of the Sunday, as it were, was Constantine. Uh, when Constantine came along, Constantine comes along, and they looked at it, and they said, well, maybe there's not a literal thousand years. You see, we are so prone with our theology to look through our glasses of how we think the world is, okay? If, if you're favorable towards uh, the Republicans, you may stop and think to yourself, well, I don't think Jesus is coming back any day because, well, the Republicans are in charge. Or if you're... Uh, looking at the Democrats, and you say, well, you know, the Democrats are in charge, so I think everything's going to be good. But if you're on the other side of it, you're turning around going, oh, Jesus is coming any day, right? Right, I mean, that's true. We tend to look through, and I, I'm as guilty as anyone. Uh, before I went to China, I thought the Lord was coming day after tomorrow. And then I went to China, and I thought, wow, God's doing amazing things there, and there are people there that are ready to, to take the gospel to all of those areas that are so heavily populated in the world. I could see Jesus not coming back for a couple hundred years. I know. 
Put your glasses back on, right? <laughs> Watch an hour of Fox News. He'll be coming back day after tomorrow. All right? Right? But the reality is it, we, we tend to look through our own grids. And so this was impacting uh, tremendously the views towards uh, the millennial kingdom. Let me just kind of uh, move ahead so I don't run out of time. Another... Um, uh, well, one of the big issues that led to the demise of the uh, post-millennialist group, the post-millennials, because they really went out on a limb and said that the world was getting better and better, really kind of put themselves in a box. Uh, they, they really did, because what we found was uh, that the, the world wasn't getting, wasn't getting better. Uh, post-millennialism becomes more popular after the Reformation. And it's, it's kind of interesting here. Uh, with the Reformation, you have a person by the name of Augustine. If you've ever heard of Augustine, he comes on the scene. He's a brilliant theologian. Uh, he developed systematic theology. I have his book. It's about three inches thick. And there's just a lot of good stuff in there. There really is. But theologically, um, he thinks out different aspects that are helpful, especially going back to the imputation of sin, imputation of righteousness. He does some, some good work there. He was up against the Pelagian movement and some of these other things, and so there was a, a real um, battleground that was uh, pretty established there. But when he came along, he, the, the, these, these people came out of the Reformation, and they were, for the most part, um, rejecting the Roman Catholic spiritualization of things. And they were much more literal. But they never developed their eschatology. They never really spent time in that particular area. And Augustine had, had some views that were, uh, were, were pretty interesting. Um, and you can't minimize uh, basically what he was what he was all about and, and what he was uh, teaching. He made several very important assertions. Uh, he denied the millennium would follow the second coming. Um, he taught that the church is the kingdom. Okay, the church is the kingdom. And there would be no literal fulfillment of the promises made to Israel. So the fact that history has proven that Satan wasn't bound. Remember, that's got to be, if you're in the millennial kingdom right now, and Satan, is, is he bound? <laughs> okay, yeah, of course not. We, we see Satan, you know, very uh, much alive and, and, and well. And so uh, there were a lot of uh, questions that came about uh, because of that. And so when you stop and you look at the, uh, again, the premillennialists, they're going up against the Catholics and they're going up against the Reformation uh, folks, the Lutheran Church and so forth. And if you go back through the history, uh, you see that right after the Reformation, premillennialism really declined. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that they were persecuted. Fox's Book of Martyrs, they were killed. It's really hard to get a theology going, you know, when everybody's getting their heads cut off, especially when they're the leaders. Um, they're being drowned and so forth. So in spite of the rise of the Roman amillennialism, there was a small group of people, uh, those Anabaptists that still held to premillennialism, Waldenses, Paulicians, there's all these little groups and, and they were very faithful uh, to the word. Um, so don't think that there was uh, really nothing that was, was going on. So as the... the Postmillennialists are on the rise. The premillennialists are in decline. Amillennialists are just kind of out there uh, at that point in time after the Reformation. The postmillennialism system is generally uh, attributed to a, a theologian by the name of Daniel Whitby. And you'll never guess what church he came out of, what religion he came out of. He was Unitarian. Okay, <laughs> that's all you need to know. Um, his views of the millennium would really had had never it would have never gained any traction, uh, but because of the times that people were living in, it it tended to appeal to them. So 
within the post-millennialist, there was a couple of different groups. There's a very liberal group. He's much more that liberal group. And then there's this conservative group that was, was doing a lot with, um, you know, trying to apply things across the board a little bit more literally, all right? You can still be literal and be a post-millennialist. So if you're literal, you're really expecting the world to get better. Then World War II happened. Are things getting better? No, not at all. And that's the end of post-millennialism as we know it. I mean, World War II, just that, that, was the, the, that was the end of it. So where do the post-millennialists, where do the, the theologians who are post-millennial, where do they go? What camp do they, they fall into? Well, they go right over to the amillennialists. And that's where that began to flourish. So, you know, from the end of World War II here in this country, we have the rise of amillennialism uh, here. Now, amillennialism today is divided into two camps. Um, and one basically holds to Augustine's positions that this is being fulfilled in the church and the kingdom is part of the church. Uh, and the other is newer and instead of following that same line of teaching, they believe the millennial kingdom is distinct from the church age. But uh, to solve the problem uh, of interpretation and so forth, uh, they see the millennium not as a picture of a time period, a literal thousand years, but instead a state of blessedness where the saints are in heaven. OK, so those are the those that's where the fork in the road is. So on the one hand, there's all millennialists who see the uh, fulfillment of the millennial kingdom um, in the heavens uh, currently. And there are others who look at it and say, well, it's it's currently being uh, brought about by the church and the church is Israel. That's the view that's there. Well, within that kind of a swath, there is a lot of diversity, isn't there? And so you can't pigeonhole an amillennialist uh, because a lot of times they're not sure exactly where they are with it all. And they, they, they're struggling to, to try to um, uh, put that into, into their perspective. Some of the difficulties, and then I'll, I'll let you ask a question that I can't answer, I'm sure. Let, let me give you... Um, <coughs> And there's a number of reasons why amillennialism has become popular. One is it's an inclusive system. It can include all strata of theological thought. Liberal Protestant, conservative Protestant, Roman Catholic, they can all come under that particular theology. It's also simple. There's one resurrection. There's one return of Christ. You start talking about the rapture, and, and that confuses people, doesn't it? Oh, th when's Jesus coming back? I remember a theologian saying, well, Jesus comes back, but he doesn't really touch the earth. He never touches the earth. We go and meet him in the clouds. He comes down the clouds. We go to meet him in the clouds. And then at the end of the tribulation or the uh, end of the millennial kingdom, that's when Jesus' feet actually touch down on the Mount of Olives and they're split wide open. And so that's the second coming. All right. So if you have one coming, you have one coming, you have one resurrection. You know, you, you, it's a very simple, you know, pretty clear cut, okay? Incidentally, when you're looking at doctrinal statements, most of the doctrinal statements, when you come to the section on prophecy, are as vanilla as you can get. I like vanilla, but there's no mention of the rapture, and they're all pretty much amillennial statements, even in churches that believe in the rapture. They, they're all, they're amillennial statements. Um, so when we redid our doctrinal statement here, we put in there the rapture so that people understood this is what we believe. We believe that Christ is coming and that there's a distinction between the church and Israel. Um, those are things that we hold to. So, um, but by and large, you won't see that. And, and this is the, the reason uh, why. It's just it's a simple eschatological system. And... Uh, it readily conforms, this is a big part of this, it readily conforms to the theological presuppositions of covenant theology, all right? And uh, I could go off into covenant theology. I, I'm not covenant my theology. I'm dispensational in my theology. I believe that God dealt with man at different times. More revelation came, things changed. 
And over time, God kept giving more revelation and man had different responsibilities as he received that revelation. All right. So this theology that we're talking about here, the pre-trib, pre-millennial, it, it just it's a out. It's born out of the literary interpretation of the scripture. And to me, it's very, very simple. I would struggle mightily with any type of spiritualization of things where things could just be anything you want them to be. Uh, and you know how people will say, well, you know, they're critical of the Bible. They'll say, well, you know, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. You ever heard that? That's only true if you spiritualize it. And in that case, I would say, yes, I would agree. However, given rules of interpretation, uh, according to the literary method, you cannot say that that's true. We would say, no, you can't do that. You, you, you can't just make it say anything. Context is going to determine the meaning. And that's a huge uh, point to consider. Let me give you seven dangers um, associated with the amillennial method of interpretation. Um, one is uh, the method of spiritualizing things. That's definitely a danger. Um, I, I would say that there needs to be care, um, definitely. Also, um, you have to watch with the amillennial position because oftentimes there's a mingling of interpretive methods. So sometimes and, and oftentimes there are people who would say, no, I believe in the literary method of interpretation and they apply it all the way through the scriptures, but then they come to eschatology and they change their method of interpreting. And, and that's, a, that's a danger. And they'll go from literal, yeah, some things can be literal, some things can't be literal. Okay, so the post-millennial have said, yeah, we believe in a literal thousand-year reign. Things are getting better and better. And that at least you could hold them to that, right? And then when they said, you know, uncle, things aren't getting better, <laughs> then they could jettison the position. Um, but it's so difficult when it's uh, spiritualizing. Uh, also, you have to remember, um, let me just, uh, spiritualizing is really the, the, the main problem. There's just a whole lot of offshoots uh, from that. And it, it's really a neglected area of study, uh, this whole eschatology among a millennialist. You're not going to pick up an amillennialist book that he wrote on prophecy. Okay, you just you just don't find those uh, out there. Um, it would be interesting if uh, if you if you could find uh, find that. So, also uh, uh, the current modernism that we see today uh, is almost entirely amillennial. Uh, and again, that's going to apply to your mainline denominational churches and also the Catholic Church as well. Uh, they're going to be amillennial um, as well through that process. All right, so let me just, uh, I got to move on. Any questions? Yeah, thousands. Um, <laughs> and I probably can't answer them, but if you have a simple question, I can try. So four views, right? We have four views. Go ahead.
Yeah. 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 Uh, when when your covenant theology uh, in your covenant in that in, in your theology you're you're moving through the the covenant of works and the covenant of grace and we're in the covenant of grace according to that uh, system and the difficulty is if we're in the covenant of grace and we're only seeing those two by the time you come to the end times uh, how do you how do you acknowledge a kingdom that is Jewish and it's oriented towards the Messiah and there's so much in scripture that's pertaining to you know the the Jewish fulfillment of these promises uh, to the point where next week when we get together we're going to talk about the worship in the millennial kingdom it's it's pretty interesting I mean in in either you jettison that and you spiritualize it or you look at it and it's like whoa uh, this is this is pretty interesting stuff uh, and so we'll talk about that next week. We'll also talk uh, next week, uh, just what's your appetite a little bit, because some of you have, have asked me, you know, well, what's, you know, we're walking around in glorified bodies, and there's people there that aren't, and, you know, where's heaven, where's this, where's that, and we're going to try to explain that as well, and there's some interesting scriptures. I think we can put it together, and I think it'll make a lot of sense for you. So, so again, the problem for the amillennialist with his covenant theology he comes to these passages and he doesn't know what to do with it. And so the answer is spiritualizing it. So, for instance, you, you, you can listen to some good, you can listen to some good preaching that's basically uh, pretty much a literal and, and fair examination of the scripture all through the scriptures. And then you come to the end times and it's like, it's like, well, where did that go? You, you, you know, some of these guys will, will preach and they're very faithful to the scriptures all the way on through. They get to the end and it's like, what just happened? You just changed your hermeneutic. You believed in the literary method of interpreting the scriptures all the way until you got to Revelation and now it's all spiritualized. And I agree that there's a lot of symbolism in, in Revelation, but we're not talking uh, just so much about uh, symbols and so forth. We're talking about whole hunks of passages of scripture that deal with the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies and either they're literally fulfilled or pick away, right? Your, your guess is as good as mine. And so I, I think to be consistent with our hermeneutic is really where this comes to bear. That's really where things, things tend to rest, all right? All right, any other questions, comments? Yes. Yeah. Well, and and it's it's a privilege to do that. What I want to see, though, is I want to see people who understand it as well, who can grasp it to the degree that they can have confidence in these passages of Scripture and also teach the rest of the generations. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the new younger generations coming up through um, are not, for the most part, sitting under really solid Bible teaching. Uh, and those of us who are older remember the days when you went to church in Sunday school and it wasn't all fluff. You actually opened your Bible and then you had morning message and then you came back for the evening message. <laughs> and then there was a Wednesday night Bible study as well. that was pretty heavy duty. And, you know, we, we didn't get to this point maturity wise, you know, by skipping class, we, we, we went, and a lot of times we went because we were made to, but that's okay. Uh, we, we learned, and uh, younger generation, um, there's, there's serious concern uh, over their level of understanding because what's ended up happening is uh, the generation that I'm part of 
is dying off and the younger people are not flocking to the seminaries. And that's, I'm off on a hobby horse right now, I understand. Um, but my Bible college shut down. <laughs> my seminary shut down, you know, um, lack of students. And uh, that's very, very common. Uh, Bible college after Bible college, um, you know, and I'll hear that, you know, Clearwater Christian just shut down. It's like, what? Uh, Northland University shut down. And these, these schools are shutting down. And you have a consolidation in some of these big schools now. And, uh, you know, um, God's still at work. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but the number of people who are going into the ministry is weighed down. And I get on my hobby horse. So it's amazing right now how many pastors pastor churches without theological degrees. They, don't, they, they never went to seminary. They don't even have Bible college degree. And, and yet, I mean, I've, I've conversed with people that have big churches. And it's like, well, where'd you go to school? Well, I really didn't. Um, you know, school hard knocks, life lessons. Um, I'm very relational, though. I've heard that a number of times. I'm very relational. Um, I like to get around people, talk to people, pray with people. And those things are all good, and that's wonderful. But the bedrock has always been theology. And, and not, not to make you lose any sleep, I remember when if you were going to a seminary, you wanted to see how many of the professors had a THD, Doctorate of Theology. In order to get a Doctorate of Theology, you had to have your undergrad degree. Then you ended up getting your Master of Divinity degree. Master of Divinity degree is not a 30-hour 30 30 hour program. It's a 96-hour program requiring Hebrew and Greek. And once you were done with that, you went and got a Master of Theology. That was a 30-hour program that required you to write a dissertation. Then you went off and got your Doctorate of Theology. I mean, you were in school till you were 40. And then you were teaching uh, as a professor in a seminary. And when you taught, you, you had such knowledge of God's Word that it was astounding. Now listen to this. There, you could hardly find a school that offers a THD program. I don't even know of any off the top of my head. I mean, I know Dallas Theological Seminary, big school, Texas, they removed the language requirements from their MDiv program so that they could attract more students. You know why? Because everybody is going to college, getting a four-year degree in college of any sort, okay, pottery making, and then, then they're going off and they're getting an MA in ministry, a master's in ministry, which you all probably, honestly, you probably all know more theology than they teach in a master of theology. It's just a, it's a, or master of ministries, not master of theology, master of ministries. It's like a 23-hour, and it's, it's nothing. It's nothing. And then they go out, and, and now they're the pastor of a church. So... This is where things are. This is where things are going, and it's very concerning to me. It's very, very concerning to me. Um, so, I I, 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 I don't know what the answer is. Um, I, I'm refreshed by the fact. It's called, it's called rapture. <laughs> well, here's what I'm refreshed by. I'm refreshed by the fact that in countries other than the United States, uh, there is a passion for the Word of God, and uh, people are being trained at these higher levels and they're going off and they're doing ministry like we used to here. Um, and I, and I, I just hope that um, wherever the Lord leads us all, that if you're in a church, you're looking for a pastor uh, someday, that you'll look and you'll say, you know what, Master Divinity, that's the bottom line. You've got to have that. Because we were always taught that that is your degree for sifting through heresy, um, you have to have that as a baseline. Um, and again, uh, so many places, it's, it's, it's not required uh, at all. And people don't want to put the time in today. That's the problem. They don't want to put the time and agony into getting these ridiculous degrees, <laughs> okay? Because your life, a anyone who, a do we have any doctors or lawyers here? Okay, yes, yes. You go through school, and you know that there was like three years of your life, you didn't even 
know anything. You didn't know anything but what you were studying. You ate, drank, and slept it. You had no fun time. You had no goof off time. You go to seminary and you're like phew, focused. And people don't want to do that. And uh, that's, that's the tough part. So anyway, thank you for your comment, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cut this out of the, the, the audio and, and, and filter it. All right. We have to keep rolling. I think it's raining hard, so you don't want to leave. So we're not going to leave until we're done. Uh, it's done raining at least. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about um, Israel, the subjects in the millennial kingdom, and specifically looking here uh, at uh, what is happening here with Israel uh, during this period. Israel has a restoration that is yet future. There is tremendous prophecy, as you know, concerned with the restoration of the nation of Israel. Uh, there is, first of all, a regathering that's associated with the second coming. And, for instance, Matthew chapter 24. I'm looking here to see what scriptures you have. You have Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he'll send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they'll gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. I, I, I view the people of Israel as the elect of God. This is what we're seeing here. They are the elect of God, God's chosen people, and he's bringing them back uh, together. That's a major point of theology in the scriptures, there are many, many verses, and I think I, I put several of them down there for you. Um, I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I'll say to the north, give up, and to the south, uh, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth, even every one that is called by my name. That's Isaiah 43. Uh, it shall come to pass, after I have plucked them out, I will return and have compassion on them, and will bring them again, every man to his heritage, and every man to his land. That's Jeremiah 12. I will bring them again to the land, Jeremiah 24. Ezekiel 28. When I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered, then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob, and they shall dwell safely therein. So there's tons of these passages, Amos chapter 9 and Micah 4, 6 and Zephaniah three twenty. I, I wrote down uh, a number of them for you uh, so that you could, you could have a head start there with that. So this is a dominant theme in prophecy, and it will come to fulfillment at the second coming of Christ. So that's why when you're listening to uh, some of the TV shows, if you pick up, you know, uh, Jimmy D. Young, uh, some of those guys that, that talk about Israel and what's going on over there in Israel, they'll talk about the, the regathering of the people of Israel. Uh, the Jewish people are, are coming back into the land. 1948 is an exciting year. Israel is back in the land. And they've been continually going back into the land. And so it's pretty exciting, isn't it? I mean, when you stop and you think that this is all happening, uh, which does lead us to believe, you know, there is... Absolutely. And let me just say this about time. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. The Bible says no man knows the day of the hour. But there's nothing that would impede the return of Jesus Christ, the rapture of the church right now tonight. There's nothing that would impede that from happening. There's not one thing that I can think of uh, that I would say, well, this has to happen before this can happen. There's nothing. And so Jesus Christ could come back tonight. That would be an awesome, uh, awesome thing, wouldn't it? Um, that would be fantastic. Well, Israel is going to be brought back to the land, but Israel's also going to be regenerated. And that's a, a significant part. They don't just come back. By the time the end of the tribulation occurs, there's this tremendous judgment here. Uh, we have the Battle of Armageddon uh, at the close of that seven years. Uh, there is a change among a remnant of God's people. Remember, the 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from every tribe, Revelation says, will be out there giving the gospel to the world. And evidently, uh, much of their evangelism takes place among the Jewish people. And I believe the Jewish people 
have such a change of heart uh, that it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Uh, and finally, I mean, stop and think about all the things that have happened in the Scriptures where God has tried to embrace the nation of Israel, His chosen people, and they've pushed away from Him. And that's a <laughs> confirmation of that. And, and, and what, what's going to happen is finally they're repenting. Finally, they're coming back. Finally, they're acknowledging that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, how rewarding is that uh, for God? You know, you stop and you think about it. Um, Regina, I think you asked me, why, why is this millennial kingdom? Why, why is there this? And, and one of the big reasons is that God has always uh, had a plan that was a perfect plan where his chosen people were worshiping him. And all along the way, Satan has blocked that. And they've been... They've been willfully set against God. And here, you finally have a time where, where their hearts, while Satan's still here, their hearts turn to Jesus, and you have that, that awesome moment of the second coming. And then we have this kingdom. Satan is taken out of the world and imprisoned, and the people of Israel are able to come and embrace Jesus as Messiah, acknowledging that they have crucified the true Messiah and they are now placing their faith in him. And this is a wonderful time uh, where the people of Israel are brought uh, to, to God and to Christ. And, and it's just so phenomenal. Notice uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 26 and 27. Paul writes this and he says, And so all Israel shall be saved. Just that statement alone is a blessing, isn't it? And so all Israel shall be saved, as is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them when I'll take away their sins. Um, and there's just a whole host of passages that talk about this. Um, and this is important. As we notice here, as we notice here, let me take away the post-millennialist, amen? All right, yeah, that, that view's not here anymore. The people that come into the millennial kingdom are all saved. They're all saved. And uh, many of these people are Jewish that come into uh, the kingdom. And this conversion that they have at the end of the tribulation prepares them spiritually to be able to enter uh, into the land. So it's wonderful. Israel becomes the loyal subjects, basically, of the Messiah. The, uh, the Old Testament saints are resurrected here along with the tribulation saints. Um, they are also resurrected. Uh, but they are given, but they're given glorified bodies. So the people that are, let me see if I nail, the people that go into the millennial kingdom are people who are alive, who have faith in Jesus at the second coming. So they don't die during the tribulation. Right. So not all of the, during the tribulation period, we know that there are some Jews and some Gentiles who will receive Christ. Others will die in their sin. So those who die in their sin go to a place called Hades. And Hades has people from way back in the Old Testament going into it. Uh, people during the time of Christ. People during the the. Tribulation will go into Hades. And even people that are wicked um, who are cut off during the millennial kingdom will also end up in Hades. All right? And only those who are saved, who place faith in Jesus Christ during this period here and are alive will go into the millennial kingdom. So if you get killed with two days left in the tribulation and you're a person who's saved, you will go to heaven and you will be resurrected two days later. Isn't that great? Yeah, that, that's, it's all good. If you're saved, rem just remember this. If you're saved, you're part of the first resurrection. The, don't let that title, first resurrection, mislead you. 
At the rapture, the church age is resurrected. We're part of the first resurrection. The Old Testament tribulation saints are resurrected at the end of the tribulation. They're part of the first resurrection. First resurrection is good. Second resurrection is bad. Second resurrection happens where all of these people here who have died and are in Hades are judged at the great white throne judgment. And then they are cast into the lake of fire. Well, I, I read the end of Revelation, um, and it talks about the, the great and small, those in the bottom of the ocean, doesn't matter. They're all resurrected. And they all stand before God for the final judgment. And so it's a way of God to demonstrate his justness. And so he's able to look at their life. They're, they're not written down in the, you know, in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so they are cast along with Satan into the lake of fire and who's already in the lake of fire antichrist and the false prophet right so they all join up in uh in that so is that clear er <laughs> clear er right there there yeah there's yeah so there's a first resurrection and a second resurrection. Second resurrection is here. And all the other resurrections are part of the first resurrection. Jesus, the church, Old Testament saints, and tribulation saints. Yeah, so I can see where it could be confusing. Yeah. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, uh, there's the only thing you can say is that it's a question of remember Jesus when he came, he said, you know, um, I, I have not come into the condemn the world. The world is condemned already. So we're all under the condemnation. We're all under the wrath of God until faith in Jesus Christ takes us out from under the wrath of God. So all these people that have not placed faith in Christ are under the wrath of God. If you have to go back to some of Jesus' teachings to see that there are different, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, levels of uh, uh, suffering. Um, when Jesus says it would be better for them, you know, that they were never born, or that, that you know, it's, it's better for those who are in Sodom and Gomorrah than for these uh, who, you know, so, so it seems like there's levels in hell, and that's probably where that thought comes from. So at the judgment, um, yeah, uh, maybe someone who never heard the gospel, uh, they're all going to go to the lake of fire. That's the bottom line, even those who never heard the gospel, and s hence our missionary efforts, right, in the world and our need to evangelize people around here. So that's a very important um, point, but the level of suffering is, you know, there's different determinations there, without a doubt. That's right. That's right. There's there's no one who's going to be able to say, well, you know, um, and, and one of the, the one of the interesting things here, because because of this, you have this one thousand year period. And finally here, Satan is loosed and the Bible says he's, he's loose for a short time. There have been uh, theologians in the past, not, not orthodox theologians, but theologians in the past who would blame uh, the environment. Well, people are sinners because they live in a, a sinful world. They, their environment's bad. And what the millennial kingdom, one of the things it points out is the fact that this has nothing to do with our environment. There is a perfect environment. Christ is on the throne. Righteousness is being enforced. Wonderful things are happening. And yet when Satan comes out and he whistles to the masses, uh, those who've not truly put faith in Jesus rally to his cry. And uh, they prove that it has nothing to do with the environment. What it has to do with is our sin nature. That's the, that's the thing. 
All of these people who are born in the millennial kingdom have a sin nature. Uh, If you're saved and you go into the millennial kingdom, Jew or Gentile, is it possible for you, even though you're saved, is it possible for you to sin? Absolutely. Absolutely, it's possible for you to sin. You're going to need to keep a close account with God just like we do today. So, uh, but your environment is not what is corrupting you. Uh, Absolutely not. Say that again. Uh, that's a that's a great question, and it and it depends on the timing of the the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, most think right now the judgment seat of Christ is attached to church age Christians, and that the blessings that the people experience are much more uh, related. Almost the, the best way to think of it is to think of it in the terms of the Old Testament covenants. Okay, Think of the Mosaic covenant, very simple covenant. If you do good, you'll be blessed. If you do evil, you're in trouble. So it's very, it's very much that way. So the rewards, uh, in a lot of ways, happen during this period of time. As I'm obeying the Lord, I'm being blessed. I'm being blessed. Think of uh, who's a great example in the scriptures who is blessed. Um, um, man, oh man, brain freeze, total brain freeze. All his, all his uh, animals. He is Jacob. Jacob, who's I, who has I? Th- I was thinking of Jacob. So Jacob, you know, you you see how his flocks grow, his cattle, and everything else, and it's like, whoa, what is happening with this fellow? You know, it's pretty amazing. And there's a lot of people like that who who saw the blessings of God uh, in their life. I think you'll see the blessings of God in that way. And I think that the aspect for the church is different, but I could be wrong. Okay. I'm thinking, yes, that's the case. I'm thinking that the rewards apply to the church age believers. It's New Testament. You have that. Um, but I can't say for absolute 100 percent sure. Yeah. Yeah. Until we get there. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, I, I'm 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 pretty sure I'm missing something. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. All right. Good. Well, let's continue to go on here, um, and then uh, hopefully I can, I can take a couple more questions. The people of Israel are the Messiah's subjects during this millennial kingdom, and Israel is truly, uh, as a converted people, are, are not only reunited, but they have an exalted position in the world. They're exalted above the Gentiles, uh, Isaiah 14, 1 and 2. Isaiah 49, 22, and 23. Israel's made righteous. Um, And also, the nation of Israel will become God's witnesses during the millennial kingdom. And that's an important uh, important note there. Now, what about the Gentiles during the millennial kingdom? Well, we know that Gentiles are brought into a right relationship with the Messiah. Messiah. Uh, And their participation during the millennial kingdom uh, is promised as well in scriptures. Uh, There's a number of passages, and I'm not sure, did I put some passages down in your notes? All right, let me give you a couple passages here. Uh, For instance, um, Isaiah 2, verse 4, chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. Isaiah 18. 1 through 7. Zechariah 8, verse 20 through 22. And so you see that they have a a place during the millennial kingdom as you search through the scriptures. Uh, But the Gentiles will be Israel's servants during this age. Isaiah 14, 1 and 2. 
for instance. So the nations that were usurping authority over Israel throughout history, uh, they will be in a uh, submissive position to the people of Israel. Israel will be exalted. Isaiah 49, 22, and 23. Isaiah 14, 1 and 2. <laughs> 49, 22, and 23. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read for you Zechariah. Zechariah 8, verse 22 and 23. It says, so many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, ten men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Isn't that great? Uh, that's the desire. They will recognize that the people of Israel are being blessed, and they'll want to experience that blessing. Um, that, that, that's pretty neat. I don't know how the amillennialist translates that passage of Scripture into something that's happening up in heaven. I'm not sure how that works out in heaven. These Gentiles, to whom the invitation uh, is given, uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, says, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. Let's talk a little bit here about Jerusalem uh, in the kingdom. Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom will become the center of the millennial earth. Zechariah 2, 10 and 11, for instance. And so Palestine becomes really the epicenter of everything that's happening in the world. Jerusalem's the center of the kingdom rule. That was the center of David's government, and it's the center of Jesus Christ's government. Number three, the city will become a glorious city. It's going to bring honor to Jesus Christ. The city's protected by the power of the king. You want some verses for that? Isaiah 14, 32. Jerusalem will never fear for its safety as Jesus is there. Shalom. <laughs> In the greatest of measures, shalom. Jesus Christ is at the center, and he will ensure its peace. So at the center of it all is the, the wonderful aspect here of, of Christ uh, protecting his people, giving them what they've wanted all along, which is to be at peace. They were the land between superpowers on either side, and they have been uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, trodden underfoot many times. That's not going to happen during this millennial kingdom. Also, uh, the city will be greatly enlarged over its former area. This city is going to grow. Uh, as we said, it's the epicenter of the world. So it's the, the boundaries are, are going to expand. Jeremiah 31, uh, 38 through 40. Ezekiel 48 talks about it uh, extensively. Ezekiel 48, verse 30 through 35, talks about the enlargement of this area. It'll be accessible to everyone during that day. All who seek uh, the king and an audience with the king will find him. That's Isaiah 35, 8 and 9. And Jerusalem will be the center of, it will be the center of worship. So over in Zechariah chapter 14, Zechariah 14 speaks to, to some of this, and we'll talk about this more next week, 
but it becomes the, the center of, of worship, as I mentioned. In fact, uh, the nations will come to Jerusalem year after year, and I'm in Zechariah 14 and verse 16, then all the survivors from the nations that came against Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the festival of booths. Uh, should any of the families of the earth not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, guess what's going to happen to them? The Lord of hosts, rain will not fall on them. And if the people of Egypt will not go up and enter, then rain will not fall on them. This will be the plague the Lord inflicts on the nations who do not go up to celebrate the festival of booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt and all the nations that do not go up to celebrate the festival of the booth. So there you have it. There, there's going to be a lot of people coming into the city, and that's part of the reason why uh, we see, for instance, that it is enlarged. Palestine in the Millennial Kingdom, um, it's the inheritance of Israel, and it's fascinating, but this area is, is greatly enlarged as well. And really, for the first time, all the way back to the promises that God made to Abraham back in Genesis 15, you finally have the realization of the land that God gave to Abraham actually being possessed. Uh, finally, finally. So that's pretty, that's pretty exciting. The topography of Palestine is also altered. So instead of, for instance, uh, mountainous terrain, and how many people have been to Israel? A bunch of you have. You know how mountainous it is over there. Instead of it being so mountainous, there is a great fertile plain that comes into the existence at the time of Messiah. And Zechariah 14, verse 4, uh, talks about that. Remember, uh, what, what's that song where they're singing and it's beautiful for situation, da da da, da. That's uh, Psalm 48, verse 2. Israel will truly, Palestine will truly be beautiful for situation. Um, it's amazing how things will change. The topography is going to permit uh, the river to flow out from the city. Uh, look up Zechariah 14 again. I know, I apologize. It's hard to find Zechariah, isn't it? Let's dig around. In Zechariah 14, it talks about the second coming, and it says the Lord will go out to fight against those nations. He fights on the day of battle. Verse 4 says, On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in half from east to west, forming a huge valley, so half the mountain will move to the north and half to the south. You will flee by my mountain valley, for the valley of the mountains will extend to Azel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah. And the Lord, then the Lord, my God, will come and the holy ones with him. So that's at the end of the tribulation. All those things are going to happen. When Jesus' feet touch down on the Mount of Olives and it's split, it creates a change in the topography. Ezekiel 47 is where we have to go next. So Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel is easier to find because it's bigger. Uh, and the guys that asked me last week, well, you know, what are we going to be doing uh, during this period of time? I think glorified body, you're going to be doing something different. What are the people going to be doing? Well, and somebody asked me about fishing. I think it was uh, Don asked about fishing. I, I emailed him and I said, Don, I hope you can come tonight. He's not here, but I said, I hope you can come tonight because uh, we're going to talk about fishing. <laughs> Notice here in chapter 47 of Ezekiel, it says in verse 1, He brought me back to the entrance of the temple and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. The temple's facing the east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Next, he brought me up by the way of the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate that faced east. And there the water was trickling from the south side. As the man went out east with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a third of a mile, led me through the water, came up to my ankles, and he measured off a third of a mile, led me through the water, came to my knees. He does another third of a mile and leads me through the water, comes up to his waist. He measures off a third of the mile, and it was a river that I could not cross on foot. For the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in. So there's swimming. And there's a river that couldn't be crossed on foot. 
And he asked me, do you see this son of man? And he led me back to the bank of the river. And when I returned, I saw a very large number of trees along both sides of the river bank. I mean, can't you just envision this? It's just beautiful, isn't it? And he said to me, this water flows out to the eastern region, goes down to the Arabah. When it enters the sea, the sea of foul water, the sea of the, the water of the sea becomes fresh. He's talking about the Dead Sea. It becomes fresh water. And not only does the Dead Sea become fresh water, but every kind of living creature that swarms will live wherever the river flows, and there will be a huge number of fish because this water goes there. And since the water will become fresh, there will be life everywhere the river goes. So there's going to be fish there. Are there going to be fishermen? Verse 10, fishermen will stand beside it from En Gedi. Karen, you and I were in En Gedi. All the way to En Elgame. And these will become places where nets are spread out to dry. Their fish will consist of many different kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. Yet its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be left for salt. Ah, so this is the Dead Sea. All kinds of trees providing food will grow along both banks of this river. Their leaves won't wither. Their fruit will not fail. Every month they will bear fresh fruit because the water comes from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be used for food and their leaves for, get this, medicine. Medicine. Whew. That's a pretty interesting passage. You better keep that one handy so you can go back and read that again. Uh, well, we're not, we're not concerned with being sick, uh, but the inhabitants, the billions of people who are living in fleshly bodies will get, you know, will have opportunity to use those things. So they're going to be living life. Uh, they won't be sick uh, Generally, but, you know, there, there will be some who will be sick. You're going to skin your knee. And you take that leaf, put it over your knee, boom, it's fine. That's right. This is the ultimate in the health care plan. If the con- Congress could ever wrap their head around this, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, this is the best news. I mean, we don't need Congress during this period of time because you have Jesus, a theocracy. So isn't that wonderful? All right. So a lot of these things are, are happening, uh, and it's, it's an exciting time. Um, there is so much productivity and fertility in the land. Amos chapter 9 and verse 13 uh, basically says this. It says, the plowman will overtake the reaper because of the productivity of the land. Do you, you get that? Will you hurry up and pick those whatever, so that I can plow this under and get more seed in the ground. And it will grow so fast and it will be ready for harvest so quickly that the plowman's job is just never done. I mean, right now, if you're a grain farmer and you're up in Pennsylvania or whatever, you basically, you know, in May, you're out there and you're rototilling the ground and you're spreading manure and everything you do and you plant your corn and, you know, knee high by the 4th of July, they say, and by August you're eating some, some corn and, you know, that's just wonderful and you're harvesting it uh, big time, cutting the, the feed corn after it dries some on the stalk in October. And the deer are running through there and it's, the bears are eating the corn, etc. And you get one crop. These guys are going to go down there, they're going to plant it in May and two weeks later, there it is, and they've got to get their picker out. And the guy with the, the picker is getting beeped at by the guy with the plow because he wants to roto back that in and plow, you know, seed the next uh, load. And they can't get it in there fast enough. Now, that's something that, again, how do you fulfill that in heaven? How can that be spiritualized to take place in heaven? This is an amazing event. This is what God created this world to be like. Isn't that amazing? This is, this is some of the byproduct of God's goodness. And you're going to be able to see that uh, during this uh, millennial kingdom. Uh, it, it's pretty phenomenal. Also, there's an abundance of rainfall. The Bible talks about that in a number of passages. Isaiah 30, verses 23 through 25. And uh, we know in the Old Testament, rain is a sign of God's blessing. So uh, that's, that's pretty, pretty, excited, uh, pretty exciting as well. Now, let me just say this. During this end time, Palestine is going to be, there's going to be a redistribution among the 12 tribes of Israel. And 
For sake of time tonight, I'm not going to read through it, but it's Ezekiel 48. And I encourage you, go back through this week, read Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. Ezekiel 40 through 48. In chapter 48, it basically outlines that the land is divided into three portions. In the north, you have Dan, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, Reuben, and Judah. That's there in Ezekiel 48, 1 through 7. And there seems to be a line that runs from east to west. And then there's the southern portion. That's Benjamin, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulon, and Gad. That's later in Ezekiel 48, verses 23 through 27. And in between the northern and southern division is an area known as the Holy Oblation. That's Ezekiel 48, 8 through 20. And that portion of the land is set apart for the Lord. And I'm guessing if you've ever been to Mount Vernon, that's pretty impressive down there, what George Washington had. But I'm guessing what Jesus has in the Millennial Kingdom, is <laughs> he can't be compared to it. This area, the Bible says, is 25,000 reeds long and wide. And you say, well, what's a reed? Let me give you it. It's 34 square, basically 34 miles each way. And it's 1,160 square miles. Remember, Palestine is opened up. It's enlarged. Jerusalem's enlarged. But this area of holy oblation, this is the area that belongs to the Lord. Isn't that great? So Israel, there's the northern, there's the southern, but this belongs to Jesus. Okay? And during that time, there are some things that, that actually happen uh, where the holy oblation is also mentioned in Scripture. So, um, but I, I won't uh, overbear there. All right. So you, you made it through these notes. Any uh, questions? Yes, Bill? Right. Uh, Bill's asking about sacrifices during the millennial kingdom. That sounds kind of strange. Uh, but uh, we're going to study that next week. So when you come next week, that's, uh, that's coming under the worship during the millennial kingdom. So uh, we'll deal with that. And we'll deal with relationships during the millennial kingdom. What are we going to be doing as resurrected saints? So, yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that next time too. Any, any other questions? Uh, hopefully things are clear. <laughs> uh, the Antichrist appears at the very beginning of the tribulation and, uh, he finds his demise at the second coming. And there is a judgment, and he is cast into the lake of fire at the before before the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Tribulation periods, the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be revealed at the very beginning of the tribulation. Um, it seems that uh, the indication, Second Thessalonians, uh, would would show us that the rapture will take place just before the revelation of the Antichrist and who the Antichrist is. So we won't know. We probably will know th of that person, but we won't know his identity. Correct. Yep. Unless we're listening in from heaven. Do you think when you get to heaven you want to know that stuff? Fake news, all the rest. It's like, <laughs> see you later. I want to know. I, I, when I get to heaven, I want to know, you know, what time's the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? Okay. We always want to know what time you eat. And the judgment seat of Christ, when they hand out the, the awards and uh, all that, and lots of other things, uh, reuniting with, with loved ones and all of those things. So whatever's happening down here, it's not that I don't care, but I know it's in good hands. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks and praise for all the things that you've done, 
all the things that you're doing, Lord, uh, how we thank you, Father, for the advance of the gospel. We may not see the extent of the gospel uh, going forward here in this country like we'd like. But, Father, we recognize that you're still in the business of bringing people to faith. And we're so thankful, Father, that uh, that that's reality. And we pray, Lord, that as your emissaries, we would be a part of of what you're doing. And we also pray, Father, thanking you for the things you're going to do. And Lord, we just give you praise for your word and and how every detail of the prophecies given will be fulfilled. And that just is an encouragement to our hearts so very much, Lord. So I just pray that you would bless uh, each one as they go to their homes now tonight. And I just pray for a a great rest of the week. May we honor you in the things that we do and say. And may we come together for worship on Sunday, Lord, refreshed. And I pray this all in Christ's precious name. Amen. You're welcome. You're welcome. Next week is the last week. Yeah.